obligatory pause before all the technology catches up, but there it is. We are now once more uh, broadcasting fully. Welcome to Legends of the Drowned Isles Campaign 2, The Great Confusion, a homebrew D&D 5th Ed campaign in which I create all kinds of weird things and then I show some of them to my players and then I throw the rest out because they're really too weird for, for, for anybody's consumption. So whatever weirdness you see in this campaign is only 1% of the weirdness has gone through my brain. Nice. I'm the host and GM. I am Mark the Encaffeinated One. And I'm joined by my players, uh, starting on my left with Pat. Hi, I am Pat. I am playing Silas the Untrustworthy. Oh, dear. Hi, uh, I am Marie, and I am playing Annie who trusts no one. <laughs> I'm next, and I'm playing Medrick, half orc cleric. Who I think everybody trusts. I think he's like a likable guy. Yeah, he tries. He's warm <laughs> to the touch, even, and uh, he really warms on you after a while. Sometimes literally, <laughs> he warms up to people really easily. But it was... That's true. That's true. Well, uh, we once again return to the small town of Aelthwater on the eastern shore. Sorry, the western shore of Eskis. And the, the 55 islands of Omatia, this strange little world surrounded by massive deserts. And once more, we return back to, well, more or less where we left off. A bit of discussion had been had after having rescued what has become a new friend, a strange, uh, about a foot tall, I believe, uh, ratkin, rat guy, ratimus whatever he might be called. He's also known as Horus, although some people call him Slugworthy. Uh, a strange and very uh, chipper little fellow whose voice I'm going to try to recapture again, but it has been about a month since I uh, spewed forth his, his uh, brand of, of happy chat. But after having rescued him, who fell through or took advantage of an open portal from someplace referred to as Omesha's Shadow... Um, you then caught up with Dudek, Dudek Bitterhorn, a researcher and someone who had been looking into and trying to recapture the history of a lost group of, of interplanar explorers called the Argenti Segex. In that mode, after having met and discussed a few things, um, Dudek asked to see and borrow a book that you guys had found quite some time ago. And with a little bit of reluctance, Annie revealed the strange and somewhat destroyed stone-bound book that uh, you had found. I believe you had found that um, with the Laughing One, or the corpse nearby the Laughing One. Yep, um, yep. And that and a few other artifacts had been found at the same time, including a ring and a, uh, a enclo an enclosed box which contained a strange sort of compass. Uh, the compass itself uh, is now seemingly a permanent part of the orrery that uh, Dudek has, having been used to power its ability apparently to uh, display the relative positions of extra planar existences or multiple planes of existence or something like that. Um, then in the hallway, as Dudek was leaving, Silas caught up to him and said, Hey, do you mind if I take a look at that book for a moment? Having been denied looking at this book for quite some time under suspicious, uh, uh, under suspicion, I suppose I might say. And yes, sometimes the untrustworthy and doesn't trust anyone does come to head. But Dudek trusts Silas, seeing him as a fellow researcher and someone also interested in extra planar things. And so he did show Silas the book, to which Silas took out the ring of Argenti Sagax, the one he'd taken from that selfsame uh, corpse a long time ago, and united the two. In this unification, the book glowed and then somewhat transformed. A pillar of bluish-white light extended from it down to the floor, holding it aloft, and upon glancing through, uh, additional pages were revealed in the book. Now, I have to see if I've got a couple of things here. 
One, I think you had seen the name before, which would have been inscribed on the inside cover. Uh, Gorfrier Riverforge. Uh, decidedly uh, uh, dwarvish name. Now, there are a considerable number of pages here. I will say for a quick moment, you can make a an arcana check just to kind of gauge the nature of these. I don't expect that you're going to stand in the hallway with this glowing artifact more than a few seconds uh, before you decide what to do next. No, we're going to escort them. Or I was going to escort them back pretty soon. But I got a 22. 22. Nice. Right. So as you glance through the book, um, it is written in Dwarven. Do you understand Dwarven? Uh, let's see. I don't think I specifically have it. However, I am carrying a thing which gives me the ability to see all languages. So uh, uh, I use the staff for uh, the spell that lets me under, uh, read and uh, speak all languages. At least read. I think you need tongues for speak. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, comprehend languages allows you if you can touch it. Yeah. And tongues, yeah, if you can hear it. I think tongues also allows you to read literal meaning, or is that comprehend languages? Uh, uh, tongues lets you understand any spoken language and be understood by anyone who speaks it. Oh, that's uh, it. Comprehend languages is the one that lets you read stuff. Right. Um, but you do have to touch it in order to be able to read it. Yep. Which he's doing. Yep. No, uh, in the tongues, the extra ability is to be able to be understood by anyone uh, yep. who shares that language. Okay. Uh, well, glancing, uh, first kind of, you notice that the inside cover, I don't think the dedication was visible before. Uh, I, I don't notes. remember. I have notes on it, but I can certainly remember. I think you. that there was at least some some of it that was available to be seen because it was like something to do with like some sort of king, but there shouldn't be another king or anything. Right. Something vague like that comes to mind. Um, yeah, there was something we had read in it before. Okay. Something well, about like a different organization of dwarves that's not supposed to be legal. <laughs> I will I will remind you of those words because it has been a while. Um, it is in an archaic form of Dwarven, um, which you're you're able to kind of understand. You can see Dudek uh, reads it fluently and is kind of looking over your shoulder, but he will comment that the uh, the 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 letters used are a very old style of script, um, and it is in it is uh, a metal page that is in fact uh, hammered into to produce that um, that square script. It is dedicated. Or it is a, a gift, apparently, to Gorfrier Riverforge, um, and the dedication it, it says, "May you find the flow of stone," and it's uh, inscribed with the symbol of Under King Goldotter, Master of Argenti Sagex. And I think it was the Under King that was mentioned yeah. before that uh, certainly sent uh, Annie into some concern because there should not be an Under King. And what, uh, it was what was the name again? Under King, uh, Gold Otter, so G O L D O T T E R, literally Gold Otter. Um, and then there's sort of an opening paragraph. Most of it, as you flip through, you realize is actually a journal. Uh, it's a journal of probably some of the searches as described in this open opening paragraph. But you do see there are diagrams. Um, there are um, close-ups of. Um, what look like some sort of crystal which has been drawn, uh, not on a great hand. The handwriting is fine, but some of the images are a little bit rough, as though uh, Gorfrier was not the best artist. Um, but And there's also arrangements of these different things with labels that seem like proper names, but they're not familiar names. Uh, even with the comprehend languages, you don't know the meaning of some of these things. Yeah. Um, the opening paragraph written in the measured hand said in Archaic Dwarven, I'm excited to begin my search for the portal. It is hard to believe that after so many years, such a thing might finally be within our grasp. The compass is very complex and will take me quite a while to figure out, which is clearly a reference to the, comp the compass, which was also there. Um, 
you let's see uh, it also does show signs of wear from claw and tooth marks uh, signs of being having been crushed having been covered in acid at some point um, but it, it's still still together being a magical artifact that's harder to, to uh, destroy you suspect but even then it is showing signs of wear and tear uh, which means it's been through, perhaps, literally, hell and back. Um, the Oh, here we go. Um, there is a label on one of those blow-ups of crystal, which it points out several features in turn, in turn uh, looking like a, almost like a crystal within a crystal. It describes those as nexus stones. Um and there's at least a dozen diagrams of configurations of nexus stones in different patterns that you assume. Uh, what is your arcana score? So, uh, plus seven. Plus seven. You assume they are for magical circle workings of some kind. Um, so have we seen these nexus crystals before, or is it just something in the book? We have seen them in the map in a Dudex workshop. You know that map that had like crystals. Um, it it resembles one of the things that would have been on his wall. Um, in fact, uh, Dudek is looking over your shoulder, getting rather increasingly excited at what he's seeing. I, I can't believe this is actually intact, as much as it is. It does look like some pages were removed, uh, but I had There's suspected. There's a lot more here than I thought. Yes, this will take some consideration. Nexus stones are mythical. But they are a core of the Argente Sagex's way of moving between planes. Um, uh, when we, uh, he'll be telling Dudek, uh, when we were in Clockwinder's uh, warehouse, there were a couple of portals that involved these crystals. Indeed. Around them. Well, it's perhaps, entirely. Go ahead. Perhaps this is the same kind of mechanism. Indeed. I know a little bit about them. They come from additional planes. Uh, uh, they are a, a natural material, but the exact creation or how they're formed is something I have not been able to find. They have the ability, once properly, uh, let's say, ensorcelled, uh, as well as configured, and with certain rituals, uh, can disrupt the the membranes between different planes. Uh, according to one of the theory books that I read, which fits as close as most of these, all the planes are actually nearly contiguous. They all touch. Not at every single point, but at numerous points. And these crystals could be used to to breach between those layers. If used improperly, hmm. the layers can become intermingled or entangled, sometimes intentionally creating portals of some kind, uh, other times, uh, well, leading to breaches. And not entirely unlike what you described before that was happening outside. Yeah. Um, how would I identify these crystals? Is there something unique about them? I mean, like, he'll pull out the big, like, the baseball bat sized piece of crystal he got that if we crushed it, it could heal him for like a few points. It's like, we found this crystal underneath where the where Clockwinder's portal took us. Indeed. It looks powerful, but I have no no ritual or spell that can identify them from another crystal. That was okay. one of the things of the of the Argentis Sagax I have not discovered. Okay. And you hear oh, from down the hallway uh, another voice. A familiar voice with a familiar level of annoyance, a bit of arrogance, 
and age. Flip the book closed. Um, as you do and as you flip the book closed, the pillar of light dissipates beneath it very quickly. Uh, but nonetheless, you hear the voice of Tassar down the hallway. That spell was very particularly removed. It is dangerous and, well, I would say rather irresponsible to use. The damage that can be done to the extra planar balance is considerable. But I congratulate you on having reunited those two artifacts. I had felt there were some in the region. And he kind of hefts up his own book. Um, and one of these can find another. The Argenti Segex mm -hmm. were, uh, shall we say, um, oh, shoot, I've forgotten the word. <laughs> loading. Uh, yeah, lo Rude. loading. <laughs> Arrogant. No, those are definitely true, but also sentimental. They like to have connection with each other. Sadly, I think that's what probably did them in the end. Nonetheless, your owning of that book would come in handy for both of us. Do we in have what, somewhere what? we can talk? I don't rather f like standing in the hallway here. So I also look over at... Uh... Actually, yeah. fudge it. <laughs> here, let's, go, let's all go back in the room. It's fairly <laughs> quiet. Um, there was a, a low thrumming that you heard when the when the energy was expelled from the book to hold it up. It wouldn't have been that noticeable through a doorway, but it is something where you felt the sort of level of energy this book had created. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, as those those guys have left, was there anything in particular that, that Annie and Medrick and perhaps Horace were discussing? Or is Horace just telling you, Unbelievable tales of daring do. Hello, my lady. Hello, my honey. Hello, my right dumb girl. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think if I recall correctly, a big part of what we were talking about was trying to figure out if slash when stuff changed and where he was from. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's and... where you had discovered, or Annie had discovered, that she could not remember beyond four generations. Yeah, and she was basically having an, an existential crisis about it. I'm just going. But I studied it just yesterday. What the fuck? Mnemonic devices. <laughs> what started with the A? <laughs> For his part, Horace is familiar with the symbology of the family, mm -hmm. but none of the names seem to ring true to him, and he can't produce any names. Um which, given his spotty memory, could just be a symptom of that. It's weird, and I think everybody here has experienced that moment when there are things that you can remember absolutely clearly, and they're, they're stupid little details. But you try to re remember anything you think is important around that thing, and you cannot drag up those things for, for anything you're worth. And it feels like that's what Horace is going through. The weirdest things come to mind, but the other things are blanks. And as you're having this discussion and Horace is trying to, um, probably trying to calm Annie a bit as well, seeing that there is some distress that's being created by this moment. Uh, and even, even you, he starts rattling off poetry and it's that sort of dog roll that is intended to be told at bars. Um, I see. It's meant to be silly. It's meant to be funny. It's meant to rhyme in absurd ways. I can't produce it on demand, but imagine that Horace is doing that. And as the door opens up and you see uh, Silas, I guess, walk back in, me, uh, uh, Dudek in tow. He's just like, everybody back inside. <laughs> <laughs> and behind all of them is sort of the, the weird, if you will, pale cloud shadow of Tassar, who has his permanent uh, grimace on, still dressed all in pure white. I'll just nod and wave at him. I'm glad that he actually like came to visit because we can get more information. Okay. <laughs> and know Dudek. what the fuck's going on. <laughs> Silas will go, Dudek, Tassar. Tassar, Dudek. And he like actually puts up the air quotes. 
Um, the room <laughs> is a little bit tight because this is basically Annie's room, and now there are. <laughs> Uh, even if Horace is kind of small, I think that it makes up for it because uh, uh, Tassar is fairly tall. It's a little bit crowded in here. Um, I'm like sitting on, on the desk. like. <laughs> yeah. And probably beside you sitting on the desk is, uh, is Horace. Um, um, uh, Tassar, uh, actually, Dudek would extend his hand to Tassar. Tassar would look down on it and say, I know who you are. <laughs> And kind of dismissively. <laughs> it would seem uh, that there are mutual opportunities here. Yes. Yep. Silas will pick up, if there's like a little, a tiny rock off of someone's shoe or something, and throw it at Tassar to see if he's actually there. Um, it, it Instead hits of, him. you know, poking him. No, it, it, li it literally hits him <laughs> and it kind of looks down at Bounces off his off his chest. That <laughs> he might not want to be touched. <laughs> Just making sure you're actually here. Believe me, I wish I were not. But the opening of that book sent a signal I could not ignore. Okay, everybody, pay attention. And Silas will put the ring to the front of the book again and open it back up. Um. Horace kind of scampers to get a better view. That's a rather brilliant looking book. Isn't really? it? It's a very powerful artifact, which hopefully you'll be able to use to some good effect. Under my guidance, of course. No. Just so every... Hey, he'll look over at Annie and Medrick, make sure everybody's seen the book, and then he'll close it back up and hold it beside him. It looks like this book contains information on portals. That is correct. Them? My suggestion was going to be that Dudek and I look at it to see if we can find a way to reach our various compatriots. But it looks like Tassar already also has an interest. I'm sure you and that one could take a considerable amount of time to try to interpret the book, but it would waste too much of what I need to get done. And both you and I have a need to have some speedy recovery. What do you I want to get done? I can't possibly teach you all the things you need to know, but we can go through um, a necessary set of steps. Are you offering to teach us how to use portals to assist our friends? I'm offering you the chance to learn enough to hopefully do something like that, yes. As well as a few other things that I need to get done, which will ultimately assist, assist you as well. In things particular, like what? finding Cathron. Who's Cathron, after what all? Is you what is your interest in Catheron? Professional. One might say that the two of us are colleagues. It's inaccurate, but sufficient. Are you adversarial? <laughs> Depends on what day, I suppose. But no, not in the way that you might mean. We have similar goals, just different ways of doing it. Okay. Well, it's got my vote. What do you two think? I mean, we do we do need to find her. Yeah. We don't really have a choice. Although I would like to know what else you're trying to do. Nothing less than save the universe, of course. Right. Then it seems we're on the same page. Depends on what parts of the universe he means. And what does he mean by saving the universe? That seems... Much bigger than I was expecting. Uh, this place seems to be a nexus of strange things happening and powerful entities wanting to take the place of a dead god. And Titan pieces breaking out of mountainsides, uh, notwithstanding. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's directly linked to this or just a separate thing. That also or the crystal lady. Over. 
Regulus, that was it? Crystal uh, Lady? That was her. Tell me more about this Crystal Lady. I'll just uh, relay to him what happened in the... Uh... And, and which one is, is that? Is it Tassar asking? Yeah, it's Tassar. I'm assuming. Yeah. Sorry, I have to I won't, work I won't say, like, how we got there, but the three I'll say people we were in a stomach. Okay. <laughs> and there was a Crystal Lady powering a storm device. Well, I'm not interested in domestic politics like this crystal lady and the person who was after her. So I don't think that's related. No, they seem to be another set of problems. And uh, by the way, does this name ring a bell? And I'll, I'll just write it on a piece of paper. <laughs> don't read it out loud. Yeah, don't read it out loud. He probably knows. It doesn't so, mean anything to me. Is this good. part of your domestic politics again? Uh, it, it sounds like universe politics. Ancient um, Athlonian and Titan politics. I don't think it's multiversal, but it's at least local universal. Uh, perhaps it has to do with the amount of power that is at at at, uh, at hand to grab, I suppose. Possibly. Well, the, he, the he wants to bring back. He wants to bring back the Titans to destroy the gods, if I remember correctly. And at that, um, I will have the three of you make uh, insight checks. Five. A bit of a squeak out of uh, Horace as he's kind of, you see him kind of almost like he's watching a tennis 25. match, trying to figure out, you know, what exactly is going on and what he's gotten himself into and how where he came from was very weird, but this is even weirder in a whole other way that he hadn't been expecting. Um, and 22 from, uh, no, that's an Arcana roll. Uh, five then from uh, Silas. Five for me. 25 from, <laughs> from Medrick, Medrick the Insightful. Uh, and Annie, do we have a... Oh, did that not actually... I don't see one come through there. Hmm, give me two seconds. I think I rolled, like, miserable below <laughs> five. Uh -oh. So probably not. Okay. Um, I'm just going to So Medrick with... is probably the, is the only one, and by far the only one, <laughs> given you rolled a 25, um, to kind of pick up on the subtleties in the room. Um, first of all, um, Horace is actually probably playing up a little bit his amazement. Um, it's not necessarily that he seems to know more, but he's not as surprised by some of this perhaps as you might have expected or the way that he's portraying it. Um, Dudak, Dudak is fascinated with this possibility and really wants uh, uh, Tassar to talk to him. But wow, okay, that's a strength that's save. A strength save. I, I was try, I was trying to make sure that oh, it worked for something okay. completely unrelated, and well, I'm sad that I missed that roll. You're gripping the table really, really well. <laughs> um, so uh, Dudek is trying to kind of he sees Tassar as someone who who literally knows and perhaps embodies all the things he's been looking for, and isn't speaking a lot, but is is hanging on every word that Tassar is is saying. Tassar, at the mention of the Titans, seems to grow thoughtful for a, a half second. Most people would miss it. Uh, but with your ability to kind of read people, you see that. Something about the Titans interested him, but he put his mask back on afterwards, if for no other, uh, or apparently. So in that brief instant, there's a small amount that you gleam about the others around you. But then it's gone in an instant. So he seems to know about the Titans. Something. Something, a reaction about the Titans. Um, but, um, outwardly, he says, well, maybe that is about the power, but we can do something about that, at least, to hopefully seal some of this power away. Now, your ability with the book, uh, 
and its signal that it sent to me undoubtedly could send signals to others. I doubt there are any other books like it on this plane of existence. Hopefully, as they would all be very, very dangerous. Each one is unique, but founded on the same principle. One of those Argenti Sagax wanderers, capturing the knowledge of what they find as they travel through plane and, and travel for existences. They, they are usually not the only journal of an individual. That one seems like it's fairly full. Probably pers purposeful. But it does contain a few standard things. At least I think so. I've been not having a chance to see yours. Uh, I would ask, sir, um, your name again, Silas, was it? Yes. You have some facility with magical casting? Yes. Good, good, good. Perhaps you'll be able to perform the ritual. In my examinations and my calculations based on the observations of these recent portals, these recent breaches, whatever you want to call them, I feel that they are purposeful, but somewhat scattered. What I need to do is find out more about them. But the difficulty is, if I go through a portal, I'm as just as likely as not to be stuck there. That's where you might come in. With the guidance of that book, not only would you be able to go through, but you'd be linked to me on the other side of the portal and therefore be able to come back out again. Furthermore, the book can assist you in a ritual that I believe will dislodge the energies in that space that you're in, the thing that had even allowed the portal to exist. So, by gathering that information and dislodging that energy, I hope to find the proper directions to find our colleagues. I believe you said you lost one or something in the last uh, portal opening? Yes. Two. Two. <laughs> Two, well. Still, even more urgency. And, of course, I do want to recover my colleague, Catherine. We have much work to do, and her dalliances by being swept into some other portal is frustratingly annoying. You don't happen to know why or how she was swept away, do you? I found the evidence of the energy, but not her specific mode of transport. Most of the no. interplanar travel is cut off right now. We had not heard from her in a while, and then a few days ago, I think it is at this point, uh, we... It's about a week ago, I think, actually. Yeah. Right, the haunted uh, funhouse. My companions here saw her in a mirror. Oh, right, yeah. You saw her in the mirror in the taken mansion which was only a yes. couple of days ago yes um her disappearance is about a week ago yeah that we didn't know uh do you and wasn't that when we did the fun house thing yeah there was a place like yeah, that seemed yeah, pretty okay, explainer was and there was like worms just yeah. coming into yeah, the world she, and back out. she showed up as one of the the lost beings or something and we did, uh, that's when we realized that, oh, hey, we should check on her. Maybe she's gone missing and we never get around to it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, the, you, you kind of briefly recount the Funhouse experience and the fact that there seemed to be holes being pierced through that other dimensional space. Uh, Catherine had appeared there and then at first it appeared not entirely herself and then seemed to recover herself just as she was swept in through one of the holes and knocked through into outer whatever. Uh, and then, yes, the second encounter was in a mirror in the mansion in its extra-dimensional space. Um, both Dudek and Tassar listen with, uh, with attention. Dudek kind of... You, you, you can kind of sense that he's trying to write notes down. He kind of looks for a pad of paper, doesn't have it, and so now he's just committing it to memory as much as possible. Tassar doesn't seem surprised by the capabilities of things that are happening, um, but just sort of nods um, with concentration. Uh, Horace is just kind of 
amazed and almost delightfully dancing at at the sort of story which is being played out in front of him. Uh, you can even, uh, Annie, because you're sort of sitting beside him, you can even mm. hear him actually composing this into poetry or song as he's taking the story and actually actively creating uh, a new uh, a new story out of it. Uh, maybe it's his way of remembering things or it's way of dealing with his way of dealing with <laughs> whatever weirdness is going on. You're not sure. Good. That detail can help me. This space that you said you had gone into, do you know where that is? Or how you, how you said you entered it through a carnival? And by oh, now the carnival the has packed now. up and left, actually. Um, pity. There was a beholder there. He had a bow tie. For the, the quirk in Tassar's eyebrow, which suggests, are you serious about the bow tie? Um, yeah, I oh, am, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It, it was kind of a mess. That's how we ended up with the bag of holding. Interesting. Have you taken a close look at that bag of holding to make sure that it's not holding more than you think? I'll look at any or whoever I, I, has the bag. I don't magic things, so I, I don't remember if we had or not. I don't think so. Well, no, it, no, he he he. The dude emptied it. Yeah, he did. He did a, a overturn it, and a whole bunch of stuff came out. That, that was uh, yeah. the uh, I forget his name. It's like Mavrik or something like that, uh, who was very bitter about having to give you the bag, but <laughs> felt, but seemed compelled by the statement that you gave him. Um, strangely enough. Well, that's probably for the better then. Well, good, good. What I'll be searching for is both power source and information. Where I will be able to project uh, an opening to will have some resonance with some of the energies I've been able to gather here so far. In effect, I cannot open a doorway, but what I can do is induce the other side, if you will, to open a doorway to us. Now, this could be exceedingly dangerous. Those things that were coming through before could very well be just waiting to come through again. So I would suggest if there's a place where we could do this safely, away from prying eyes, that would be best. I mean, we could go to Catherine's temple, see if there's any any information there from when she she left. That would be good. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Yes. That does sound ideal. And you see that Tassar kind of takes a deep breath. He seems like he's doing some calculations in his, in his head. Um, then I think you will do just nicely. However... It will be dangerous, and you will be tethered back to my book. Now, you have a book of your own, Silas, which is good. You won't be able to use most of it, but I can show you the few things that will be pertinent to this particular operation. But all of you will be unwelcome there, and I don't just mean that they won't offer you tea. Your very presences should be anathema to the spaces you're entering. They will actively, or even passively, want to push you out again. To prevent that, I have something I can give you. But I only have four of them, so all of you will not be able to go. And he reaches into a sleeve and pulls out um, one by one, which he hands... Uh, probably to Silas and Annie and Medrick, and in fact we'll hand two to Silas, um, what looks like a very delicate cube or outline of a cube uh, made of a silver filigree. It's hollow, and on the inside of the cube, with the same filigree extending in towards the center and wrapping around, 
a small sliver of what looks like crystal. All of this is suspended on a unremarkable uh, leather thong, an unremarkable piece of, of, of leather string. Um, these are, how can I explain it to you in simple terms? Let us call them stability matrices. What they should do is hold off the uh, desire for wherever you're going to throw you out again. Useful? Indeed. In some realms, they will also resonate with the realm itself, and there may be additional beneficial side effects. The ability to see, sometimes they will glow with light, other times they will sing to you. Sing? Oh, that sounds marvelous. Well, it's not wordly singing, it's, it's a humming, really. What tune is it? It's no tune, other than it is the tune of the space itself. They will also, usually, react to the presence of a nexus stone. And, if there are any established passageways out of the realm, they can, with some concentration, allow you to find them. Your time will be limited in these places, however. And, with any luck, if they are not alerted to your presence, you may be able to return. But I cannot well, guarantee that. What happens if one of these is destroyed? Then you will become vulnerable to the forces in that space, more so than you would otherwise. It is... Imagine it as a bubble of air while you are underwater. What happens to you when that bubble goes away? You drown. Not by a fish or shark or any other being, but by the very water itself. In this case, okay. the place would try to kill you or expel you, whatever it seems more expedient, I suppose. The exact mechanics of it are not something I know, nor do I care to find out. Not of this gesture, anyway. Um, well, Silas is a... Uh, my apologies, Horace, but I don't think this is something we wish to bring you into. Well, I, I must say that I'm... A bit disappointed, as it sounds very exciting, also very, very dangerous. Uh, if my own um, otherworldly experience should be of use to you, then I would offer it, of course. And he, he bows with a, a grand gesture. You are new to this, and I do not wish to have you entangled in something that may prove bad for you. Remember, Dudek, do you wish to come along? If I might, I would be happy to. It sounds like an opportunity I could not refuse. I believe your knowledge is something we will need. And what Silas I will, will hit the fourth one. What I will gain, and he kind of receives it from you very gingerly, almost reverently holding on to it. Um, what I will hope to learn from this is tremendous. And I can assist in whatever ritual is necessary. That's good. That would be very good. Then when will we be leaving? He'll look over at Annie. I mean, we, I would say at least let's wait till morning until we've regained our strength. Sure. Silas pets the kitty cat that just walked by. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> As Horace is like, yeah. <laughs> Cats are some of my best friends and also my worst enemies. <laughs> then shall we 
perhaps meet back here in the morning and then leave for Catherine's temple at that point? Sounds like a plan to me. I have some reading and some preparing to do, but I will be ready. As you wish, I will see you when the sun rises. And Tassar looks out the window and vanishes, appearing on a rooftop nearby. Now, Dudek, we need to find you a place where you can keep your door. Yes, well, I I could continue to rent out that warehouse, but it is a little unfortunately farther away than I would like. It would be probably safer, perhaps. Oh, <laughs> just as Nax has to head out, Silas is going to suggest the temple. <laughs> um. Because if he wants to be someplace in town, the options are kind of Marie, uh, sorry, Annie's closet or uh, Medrick's back room, someplace where people aren't normally going to go. That would be best, someplace that could be secured and hidden. But I could rent a simple apartment somewhere if you had a recommendation. It would be better if it was some place that one of us was close to for the sake of security. Indeed, um, indeed. I mean, how can it, can you, is it a full door that you're carrying around or is it the doorknob that you attach to a door? Oh, it's, it's just the doorknob. The door will manifest itself if there's no door there already. If there is a door, then whatever's behind it will simply vanish. And could somebody take this while you were inside or somewhere else? It is possible. I can take the doorknob with me, but that means that the entrance is not available. Mm. It's to be installed to be used. And that takes a ritual. That's why I think if we if we had it either at Medrick's temple or here in Marie's room somewhere, that at least is going to put it one one zone away from people just walking around or thinking to break into places, uh, so to speak. Well, as nice as the accommodations are here, and he looks around at this fairly sparse room. I might suggest, for the modest reputation of yourself, Miss Annie, that uh, a strange dwarf such as myself uh, making entrance and exits at random times might not be the best idea. Probably the temple, not. however, might Could not lead be to an a international problem. incident. <laughs> <laughs> um, um. If there was a space of the temple that I might safely inhabit, however, Medric. That wouldn't be opposed to me, so long as it's not opposed to your temple. And it's not opposed to my temple at all. I'm just trying to remember the map I drew of the temple. It isn't big. I'm not sure. Is there a spare room? Uh, I don't think there was. You I, I could probably make a spare room. Even if you just put the door on the inside of a closet. Yeah, that works. Uh, it'll make a new door, so. Yeah, it's not a big space, but I believe you did have uh, both... Uh, living accommodations for yourself and for someone else. Two and, like and documents. I, I, I'm trying to remember too. Don't you have somebody working for you? Yeah, there was Lysandra, but uh, like she was she was doing the accounting. But I'm not sure if she does it on site. She might be like right. no, she lives at home. But just okay, just being aware that there is at least one regular temple person there. Yeah, and you get to decide what security means. <laughs> Fire alarm. It's I, like an alarm, but it's, if somebody breaks in, there's fire that hits them. I was going to say, I don't think that a fire alarm in traditional sense would be needed in, a, in an Ignean <laughs> temple. I don't think anything burns in an Ignean temple. Like, yeah, that, that's, not mo that's not meant to. And it's probably made of stone. No, but yeah. I mean like an alarm as in like when somebody breaks in a jet of fire, like it's launched at them. Right, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, which means you want to make sure that you know everybody's coming in. D don't step on those yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, there's some spells. Oh, by the way, do that, but I think you got to be a wizard. Yeah, yeah. There, and in fact, I have a wizard who's planning to booby trap a place, and that's exactly it. It's a ridiculously powerful if they trip it. Um. Well, then, if um, if you don't mind showing me the space, Medric, we can make that arrangements immediately. I am literally carrying everything that I own on me right now. And he kind of reaches right. in his pocket and he produces the doorknob. Found it. The fresh bread has already left dock. So I've made my peace with them. They were good to travel with for a while, but I think this is going to be more interesting. Okay, I found the map of the temple. And yeah, there's sleeping quarters, so I'm assuming there's like multiple beds there. And then there's like a secret slash emergency exit that's just covered with, with like, I don't know, like a tarp that has like the logo of a news on it. And on the other side of that door, there is a shed. So that would be a good place to do it. All right. Sure. And Silent I could let Lysandra know that we are going on an adventure and that nobody is to enter the temple. Except her. Um. All right. Just making a note that Medric's temple is Dudek's closet. All right. Are there any other activities for that night, or are you... Well, Silas would bring the book as well, and then uh, if Dudek can open that up, Silas is going to see if he can open the book in uh, Dudek's safe area and leave it that way for Dudek to study or whether the book requires Silas to be there. Um, so you go with Medric and they go set that up and they go pass through the passageway yeah. and you enter into his, his library safe area, you open up the book, but as soon as you step more than five feet away from the book, it closes up. Okay. Does it close up and fall to the ground or close up and float over to me? Uh, it closes and falls to the ground. Okay. Is there, uh, sorry, dude, I was hoping that it could be kept open, but I guess I got to be here. Well, there's also the possibility of finding another one of those rings. From what I understand, the rings are somewhat unique to the books, but there are master rings, uh, higher ranks, I think, which might be able mm. to open more than one book. Well, it sounds like this under king, if he's the master of Agenti Segax, it's kind of a coincidence that the master of it all lives here. Well, not here, but somewhere up the way. Well, I, I'm not sure. The ranks and hierarchy are not written down per se. I found some carved records and some references. Master may not mean singular master. It might only be a ranking mm. uh, proficiency. That's Someone true. who's traveled for a long time. So I don't know if the Underking reference is something local or not, but... This area did have an underking quite some time ago. It did not end yeah. well. Okay, well, um, hmm. In that case, I think it's best if I keep the book on me since you can't study it without me here. I can try to make sure that it's safe. Please do. That book is, well, I, I don't think I need to tell you too strongly that it is a, an absolute treasure of mine uh, that I no. would love to examine. It means, well, beyond Tassar himself, it means a direct connection to those people I've been seeking. It is of great value to me as well. It is very important. Hopefully we will have some time to study it soon. But let's um, see what this portal of Tassars does. And um, one note, Dudek has a ring that's very similar to yours, but it did not have any effect on the book whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought that they were... It was how he were, recognized you the first time and was able to present the ring Yeah, um, for it to gain your confidence. Very well, I have a lot of reading to do and preparations for morning, so. Okay, I must go and prepare as well. 
I'll see you later, Medrick. All right. See you tomorrow. Silas will ride off home to uh, rest. All right. Any other business from Annie for the evening or just uh, wallowing in the existential dread? You're muted. Silently wallowing in the existential <laughs> Bit of A, bit of B. Um, I would probably go um, at, at least send a note telling uh, telling um, my brain is is forgetting his name. The captain. Varendel? Varendel. Varendel. I was, I was going to say Valorian and I'm like, no, that's my angle. <laughs> Um, just letting them know that I, something came up that I will be dealing with and that I sh hopefully we'll, we'll be back soon. Just so that I don't completely disappear out of nowhere, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I forgot. I did want, uh, Silas does want to buy a small crowbar or cat's paw. <laughs> just something for prying things a little. Uh, not a full size crowbar, but it's it's something where yeah the the demonstration of how how incredible this magic item of crowbar is that Annie's been using. Uh, um, in your note, Annie, do you tell Varendel that you're going out to uh, to the, the the he doesn't know about the hidden temple, but or are you just saying you're going to be away? Um. BBL I'm... going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll mention that um, what I'll say is that oh my goodness, I'm blanking on all of the names today. Um, that Melora? Okay, yep. Yeah. Uh, Melora is one of the ones who went through. Yeah. Uh, that she was pulled through one of the portals and we're going to try to get her back. And hopefully we'll be back soon. Okay. Um, about an hour after you send off the message, you get a knock on your door. Mm -hmm. Tired. <laughs> Drows. It's Varendel at your door, looking very concerned. You're muted, I think. Hello. <laughs> um, he has a very concerned look on his face and is standing there almost vibrating with concern. Where do you think you're Are going you... and why am I not going with you? Because we have a tether to, we're going to have a tether to this dimension and we only have enough for us to go. What can I do then? I don't even know. <laughs> I don't magic. I'm just going to help because I couldn't stop her from being pulled into the to the portal. Well, I don't want to lose you too. So please come back to me. That is my plan. <laughs> he turns and then turns back and just to make sure, he takes off one of his gloves. Mm -hmm. He takes off a ring of one of his hands. This is my family crest. I swore when I put that ring on that I would uphold my family and I would never take it off. So, and he hands it to you, bring it back or I'm in deep trouble. 
Oof. <laughs> I will. And his fingers are probably larger than mine, so I'll put it around my neck. Okay. Yeah. Plunk. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, on a, on you a chain that I have. You can wear it if you want. It will resize to your size. <laughs> it's not a, it does not become a tiara. <laughs> so I'll put it on the um on the finger beside my uh my crest. Now uh shoot, I meant to look that up before and I forgot. So I have to look something up. Um first, do you have three uh um, attuned items. I have two. Okay. Ring of mind shielding and brooch of shielding. All the sure shielding. I have one. Uh, all right. You sense the magic within the item. Do you choose to allow it to attune? I trust that he's not going to give me something that'll cause me harm. So yes. As I scroll past the ring of shared suffering. <laughs> oh, that one. Sad face. <laughs> um, My characters and rings. Okay, I have to find it here, but. I hate when I forget that I was going to do this, and then I was like, I was going to put this in my notes, so I knew exactly. No. Um. Actually, that one doesn't work anyway. Um, what you can write down as it attunes to you and does shrink to perfectly fit your finger um, with uh, his family crest on. It is a ring of protection plus two. Nice. Which is how he's managed not to die from a lot of the fights he's been in so far. So he better not die while I'm while I have it. <laughs> uh, let's... Uh, make an insight roll, please. It was his great grandmother's ring of plus nine. two protection. <laughs> uh, nine. Uh, after the door is closed and you kind of put it on, you can feel the adjustments happening. You're looking at it. Um, long after Verandell has left, you're kind of remembering the nervous look he had on his face when he handed you the ring, and you start to think. Wait, th did he mean more than this? But you're left with not knowing the answer to that question. Back of the village, at the uh, Marsh Village, Silas. Um, it's quiet. It's early evening, but your, your people are, are an early morning risers to go out and do the fishing. Yeah. Um, in the middle of town now, um, you can see the, the beautiful statue that was created by Dougal quite some time ago. Um, and around it, stones have been laid in patterns, turning, twisting, snake-like patterns now adorn this, making it more than just a statue in the center of town, but itself practically a monument and it's a trick of the light, probably the way most people would interpret it. For you, you might think of it as an actuality. But no matter where you stand, you can feel the vision of the statue cast upon you. And you can feel it expanding out over the entirety of the village 
strength, an energy of power seeping through. It's at times comforting, as the mother is wont to be, but also darkly powerful, hungry, pretentious. As mothers are wont to be. As mothers are wont to be. <laughs> um, Silas will go up and, and put his hand on it and just uh, using his mother-given telepathy uh, so think to the statue just are you there mother the statue is cold and moist under the hand not like a statue is meant to be it feels as though it has a surface of skin there is no word but you can feel that coolness seeping over you, enveloping you, holding you close. I shall build you a home here. Uh, Silas is going to go look for whoever in town we would kind of trust to go to other places and get stuff. Um, Okay. I There's... don't. I don't know if that would be his uncle and aunt. I know his uncle kind of had was originally the one who would go to the town for stuff, but I don't know if he'd traveled that far away. Um... Uh, let's see. I haven't looked at the clan for a little while, but. Um... I will say you can find somebody. I won't necessarily drag up the names yeah. now. Yeah, and that's no problem. He'll basically tell them that, uh, uh, and he'll give them a bit of money to do this because they'll need money to travel, but he needs them to go to that dwarf city or town that was like a, a ways away. It's like, a, I think it's like four or five days travel away. Um, and find some some good stonemasons uh, there uh, because Silas wants to build a home here for the mother, a place that she can call her own. And indeed wants to help build better lodgings and houses for the people of the town. Uh, do you mean going to Demthorum, uh, the mountainside uh, nearby? That might have been it. There was some dwarven town that I think we might have even visited on that trip we took with uh, Cartwright's stuff or um, it was on the way to it or something. But Yeah, so... Yeah, further along that route is Thurum, Thurum Hall, which is the a dwarven town at the base of Dem Thurum. Um, yeah. That's actually where those two diplomats who were at the party were also from. Yeah. Um, Basically, I, and he'll tell us, like, he'll give them the details that, like, he's looking to build a, a decent-sized temple that the town can celebrate at. Um, so he'll give them some sort of details of the size and of this area so that whatever stonemasons they talk to will know what they're getting into um, and say that uh, we're looking at an expenditure of time. he has a couple of large monies I think or a large money, I'd have to check. But that was like 10,000 gold a couple of times. So he basically, we're, we're looking at an expenditure of like 10,000 gold uh, to let them know what kind of things they would be needed to supply and whatnot. Um, and then just 
get them to come down here at some point in the future so we can meet and talk about what's go what we need to do. So the person you would be dealing with is Kareth, K-E-R-I-T-H, okay. Kareth Lang. Um, he's like a second cousin. Okay. Um, the Lang brothers, actually, Kareth and Janok, um, their responsibility is traveling, securing relationships, and re researching for the clan. That's actually what their role is. So they're effectively okay. the traders. So Kareth and Janok... Uh, would and that. he'll send with them like a few hundred gold is just a down payment for, hey, come and see us. We'll talk about it. Uh, so that the stone stonemasons don't have to like come here with no money paid down or anything. Uh, and then find that like we're complete jerks or something. Um, I imagine they would want some sort of uh, advance. So. Uh, and Kareth, uh looking a little bit tired because uh, actually he's probably not as early a riser as most of the fishers are. Um, yeah. But he'd be the one who's been arranging for some of the fish to be sold in town, that sort of thing. That would be the, the arrangements they would have made, largely on automatic now that they've established that. Um, would uh, would uh, nod solemnly, uh, and uh, Janek would be the one to say, for the mother, no worries whatsoever. We'll get it done, Silas. Thank you. Do you and want Dougal to be involved in the in the shaping of it? He did a great job on that statue. I think definitely in the adornments, yes. Uh, I think perhaps maybe, I mean, I would like to be involved in the basic shaping of the building or design of it. But I think perhaps the stonemasons should be allowed to do their job and then uh, Dougal can... Uh, decorate it and uh, adorn it um, as he does. We'll set out first thing tomorrow. Thank you. Praise be to the mother. Praise be to the mother. Uh, and then Silas is going to go get some sleep. All right. Uh, Nikki's already asleep kind of wakes up yeah, a little bit I, when you come in that sort of eh, half awake. Yeah, Silas feels bad at not seeing much of him lately, but uh, he'll put him back to bed and tell him a story. And that's how we killed all the infidels. <laughs> you do notice that uh, every once in a while, the way the light catches Nikki's eyes, they glow green. And the Eyelids a little weird, but close from the sides instead of the top and bottom. Yeah, that that seems to be a, na a thing in the clan. So I'm just gonna take it as a positive. <laughs> it's going to be more one with the mother. Every generation does. Yes. Uh, and then that'll be it uh, for that night. All right. All of you have a glorious, comfortable long rest we truly are living in a fictional universe where this yeah. is easy <laughs> and restorative and universal you wake up well rested what is this <laughs> nonetheless bright and early the next morning uh actually uh you don't see uh dudek bright and early in the morning medrick when you're doing your morning greeting of the sun mm -hmm. Um, he kind of crawls in somewhat after that, um, having looked like he probably didn't sleep all that much last night, uh, lines under his eyes, yawning quite a bit, um, and carrying, uh, a fairly modest, uh, backpack, uh, with him as well. Did you sleep well? Oh, there was probably sleep at some point. Unintentional, but necessary, I suppose. I'm too excited to sleep much, my, my friend. You know what this means to me. Yes, I've I've kind of figured. It means a lot to me, too. We have to rescue Melora and Grappler. Of course, of course. But so much more than that. This could be finally the steps I've wanted to take for... forever. Yeah, I can sense your excitement. Like, 
and I completely understand. Yeah, no time like the present. He's like so excited that he looks like someone who's drank too much coffee and is just like vibrating. Much excite. <laughs> <laughs> I've had mornings like that, or in lack of nights like that. So I may be channeling that a little bit in the do deck. You reconvene first at uh, the Three Bells. We probably have an early breakfast. Yeah. I also, I'm sure that I, at this point, I basically pay by the month for, for my rooms. I make sure to let them know that, like, uh, I don't know how long I'm going to be gone, but I definitely will be back. Um, so um, I'll, I'll make sure to pay, like, my, my next month and then go from there. One awkward question. Mm -hmm. Where was Horace last night? I don't know. <laughs> did we you, didn't really. Did you kick him out or did you just assume he was going to sleep on the table? What? Um, I probably would have because I believe the, the temple does have a, a spare room. So I, I would have asked Mandrake if it was possible for, for him to be brought to the temple. Yeah. Even at a foot tall, strange man sleeping in your room is a little weird. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's like a the sleeping quarters, so I'm assuming there's like a few beds in there. Yeah, I mean, remembering that Horace that will walk. not, yeah, he will not take up that much space. Yeah. Being, or even just I, give him a pillow or something. Or a cushion I think or about a foot tall was what I said, so yeah. Yeah, something like that. Uh, very well dressed for a foot tall, but um, well, uh, then at that evening you see him off uh, as you go to bed, Medric. Um, you do not see him the next morning. Okay. Next morning, Horace is gone. Did he leave a note or something? Or does not look to be a note. Well, uh, I wish him the best in his future endeavors. Hopefully, we'll see him again. Is anything missing? How thoroughly do you check? I think I'll spend a few minutes. Okay. Do you keep any money at the temple? I'd usually keep it on me, because we don't have enough money to like have a vault or anything. Okay. Uh, make an investigation roll. Rolling the dice. <laughs> Please wait. Universe determining randomness. Oh, oh. That's a, yeah, oh. that's a zero. Everything looks exactly as you left it last night. Cool, cool. There's something missing that really isn't, isn't there. <laughs> no, everything is perfectly fine. Does Dudek notice anything? No. <laughs> He's, if he had even known what the interior of the, of the layout of the temple was supposed to be, at this point, uh, his head is stuck somewhere in a book. All right. You assemble at the three bells. Uh, what time are you intending to be there, uh, Silas? Are you going to be there first thing in the morning? Are you going to be... No, um, I think Annie's not really a, a early riser. I will tell. Uh, no, no, I am. I go for, for a run every morning and then, and then right. go okay. wash up and have breakfast. Mm. Uh, Silas would be there probably um, for breakfast, but a little late. Um, before he leaves the village, uh, he's uh, well on, on his way. Uh, to town, he's going to stop at the uh, Pearl Divers uh, and bless them again with uh, water breathing uh, and remind them to uh, please keep an eye out for any really, really big uh, Pearl Oysters. Um, don't get too close to them in case they're monstrous, but uh, he's looking for a very large pearl. Will do, sir. And they can keep the rest of their profits themselves. The only thing he's looking for is information on any large 
large oysters. Okay. I also, I haven't used any of my thorns recently, so I'm going to make sure that I'm stocked up on those. Okay. Well, in any case, you gather at the three bells. You do not see Tassar. There is the usual group that come in very, very early. It is a fishing town. It is a trading town, so people come in at the crack of dawn or much, actually much before the crack of dawn. And a young woman sits down at your table. Nondescript. Stringy brown hair. Clothes kind of shabby. Are we ready to go then? Do we know her? Doesn't look familiar. Mm. Go where? Silas will check her for magic. It won't pick up illusion, but he'll look for anything else. Uh, definitely wearing magical things um, underneath the clothes. There's definitely some sort of amulet that's hanging right about here. Um, a magical ring. There's a wand. You can you can make out kind of the general X-ray. Yeah. That this person is exuding a lot of magic. Surely Got my it. my visual status is not confusing you. I thought it would be better if I wasn't seen here in the same way twice. Tessor? You can call me that. I'm ready to go. Silas has his adventuring kit on him. Okay. Just briefly, how are you planning to get there? Are you going to walk? Are you going to buy, get horses again? Some of you have horses, some of you don't. Tassar doesn't seem to have a horse. Dudek doesn't have a horse. Uh, we could rent horses for the two of them. Yeah. I think the rest of us all have horses. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dudek is probably the least comfortable on a horse. Um, it's hard to, as a dwarf, to, to sit on a, on a regular horse, but he, he's done it before. Uh, it just obviously has been quite a while. I can get him a pony. Uh, he insists That's on not getting a pony. <laughs> <laughs> That's more traditionally dwarfish. It is, but it, it wouldn't keep up as well. Um, you spend the better part of a day as it takes to get all the way out to the temple itself. The temple does not look disturbed. If anything, it looks less disturbed than the last time you were here. More of the natural growth of the forest has grown over the edges of the, of the stone, obscuring it and making it a little bit harder to find than you expected, even though you've been here more than once. It's almost as though the woods are reclaiming this land. Inside, hidden by some brush now, you find the passageway. Tassar leads the necessary ritual to open up the stairway to, to below. Does it without asking, without thinking, as natural as if he's done it a thousand times. It all responds as normal. And you go back down to the very empty space littered with crystal across the floor. Oh, kitty number two. <laughs> Can we make a trifecta? <laughs> the, sure. the, familiars, the familiars are coming out in, in strength. Some of them are less, are more indifferent yeah. than others. <laughs> you can see the pile of fur. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, well. you can't have my tea. Let's follow him down. Okay. I'll, I'll follow him down here. Tasser opens up the book. And as you saw it before, and as you saw it in your own book, uh, Silas, the extension of this white and blue light which supports it. Um, and as he opens up the book, or as she opens up the book, that form melts away into the uh, older form you've seen more traditionally, or more, more often. I'm going to teach you a ritual to do. This ritual should be done around wherever you find any nexus stone. It should disrupt the energy of it and allow you to take it. Do not try to take it without doing the ritual. It will still be embodied within that realm and very much likely could have disastrous consequences. 
and you can define disastrous consequences for yourself. I doubt you'd come back with any report of it anyway. The ritual will take some time. Make sure you're not disrupted in this ritual. What you're going to find, I do not know. The opening of this pathway is as much determined on the other side as it is on this one. I am merely pulling the string which I have noticed from some of the portals that have opened up. Do not spend too much time there. While the charms that you bear will keep you from being absorbed or repelled by the, the, the space, they will not last forever. And if they are damaged, you will have very limited time. Understood? Understood. Yes. Now, open up your book. I will more. I will strengthen the connection between our two books to make this a better tether for you. Silas does so, and he tells you to turn to the back minus five pages. Flippity flippity flip. And as you're turning through the book, you notice that going forward through the book is different from going backward through the book. As if there are multiple books contained within the one. Magic. <laughs> there is indeed a ritual there. We cannot perform the ritual entirely here because if we do so, it will be disruptive of this place. This is not tied with the Nexus Stone, at least I do not believe so. These are merely crystals of interest, magnifiers perhaps, for some of the things that Catherine has done. I do not know her magical ways, but we can run through the steps. So, uh, with Dudek's assistance, he cannot perform the ritual because he's not bound to the book and to the, to the ring. Um, but you will get advantage on these rolls. This is going to be three arcana rolls. The difficulty will increase each time. The difficulty starts at 13. 13, 15, and 17. If you fail a roll, you can't do it again. I have no idea how any of this works, but I'll, you got this, Silas. I believe in you. <laughs> Silas has got this. If, yeah, that, that can help. Um, each one of these will essentially represent one round's worth of action. If you fail, um, nothing bad seems to happen. And assume just basically when you're first getting used to it and mumbling the words, you don't necessarily know the full effect. Um, okay. You will want three successes before two failures, and this will set you up to do the ritual later on. The actual ritual is not happening right now, but this will yep. determine how difficult it will be in the moment. Okay, and again, okay. you have advantage because uh, Dudek will be helping you. Okay. First one is a 17 plus D4. Where's the dice? D4. Okay, so, so a 19. Perfect. So the next step is more complicated. And this is a matter of being able to physically move around. The book stays in place, held up by its own, its own uh, magical effect. But you find yourself having to trace in about a two-foot range around yourself. You're physically tracing uh, a sigil around the book. Okay. Uh, do I have guidance on each of these, or was it only time to have it on the first one? Um, each of these is a separate action, so if you're going to do guidance, you have to do guidance every time. I will do guidance every time. Okay. Words okay. of encouragement, you got this. Keep patting him on the back and pushing forward. <laughs> Ruinous concentration. Second one is the same. Uh, oh, not quite the same. Yeah, almost the same. But uh, anyways, a success on the second one. And now I need a 17. And this, of course, is when I crap out the first time. Of course, that's one that you don't get a 17 on. Yeah, that's a 12. So that's one failure. This one now, uh, this next roll decides it. Yay! Guidance. With guidance, that's a 25. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so yes, there's a moment where you're trying to do it and um, you're trying to mirror what Tassar is telling you to do. 
um, and finding that there was just a, a stone in the way that caused you to trip up and the whole thing had to start over again. But the second time, you feel much more confident about it and you're able to run through the entire ritual. Now, this will need some time to operate. Once the ritual is completed, it will take about a minute for it to fully take effect. And at that point, you can remove the crystal. Or if you're actually facing something else, not a nexus stone, uh, there still might be a central pillar which is controlling things. Disrupting it would be good. If you cannot do that, then come back as soon as you can. You will not be able to exit by the way you come in. I can tease a, t a portal to open, but you will have to find another one out. Uh, the dimensional matrix should be able to assist you with that. If it senses a nearby uh, shift, an opening ex outward, it will be uh, useful to you. I do not know where that will lead to, however. So, if you have the means to contact me when you arrive back here again, more is the better. If you need to, you can open the book, and I will be able to notice your location briefly. Do you understand? Yes. Yes. Barely. <laughs> the people who need to understand do, that's the important part. <laughs> well, like Medrick says, you understand, but it's like, Silas, it's all of you. <laughs> He's thinking. Okay. Oh. And we will begin. And he opens his book up to a particular place. He takes out five small stones and places them around the, uh, the space, uh, actually around where you will be, in about a five-foot uh, diameter, although it's not a specific circle. Um, these are only fragments of a Nexus stone, but should be enough to entice the other side. He begins casting his ritual. Silas is going to grab the nicest looking stone he sees on the ground. Of these? Or... No. Nope. Okay. No, nope, just from something that's been from the temple for okay. ages. There are plenty of, of uh, amethysts that have grown. This is basically the interior of an amethyst geode, a massive one. Mm. Um, so that's what most of those are. You could easily grab a small yeah. piece of that. Yeah, he'll grab like a, a, a whatever size chunk he can grab that looks nice and stick it in a pocket because something from this area may help us get back. Okay. The ritual that the that uh, Tassar performs takes about a minute. Um, and in that time, you can feel the entire space start to wobble. Not like an earthquake but like the very air itself is moving back and forth and shifting it actually feels a lot more if you've ever been in, in, in large bodies of water and feel the current or feel the waves coming in and out where your whole body is shifted by this motion it's more like what it feels like as if the entire world uh, that you know is, is elastic at the very end of it Above where this sigil is drawn, there elongates out um, like a, a rubberized uh, uh, circle stretches out onto the ground, and you see a stairway in the ground, which was once stolid ground. Go. I cannot hold this for very long. Yeah. Silas will run down the stairs. Not super fast, but I will jog follow. Downstairs. I'll also follow. Okay. And Medric follow, or uh, Dudek follows you all. And as you emerge onto the other side, above you, you can see very, very briefly after you leave the space collapses, leaving, leaving nothing more than solid stone overhead. You feel the strength of stone around you. You feel like you're in a stone room, in fact. There is no natural light at all. There is a small amount of glowing coming from Medric himself. Uh, just one <laughs> second, I need to... My cat just tried to steal my, my pencil. <laughs> 
Um, so hopefully all of you appear there. I don't know if he appears until after I move. I'll cast the uh, light cantrip. Okay. What are you casting the light cantrip on? Hammer. It is now glowing. And what is the radius of light? Like 20 feet? Uh, I think 20 bright, 20 dim, something like that. Bright light in a 20 foot radius and dim light for an additional 20 feet. Yep, there you go. So now you should see uh, everything in that space on roll 20. In fact, we'll quickly right. move over to the other side. Now, we've just gotten here. I'm I'm pretty much going to wrap it up for the night um, as we begin this adventure and start off there next time. Uh, however, I will have uh, each of you three make perception checks. If sound gives you any bonus, then by all means, use that now. Perception um, checks. Perception checks and sound, if it's important, will uh, help you. I don't Unless have sound, habitual. however, I have um, blind sight for 10 feet. Um, I will adjust your icon, but that won't help you in this particular instant. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, that is not a garbage roll. That was not my roll. Okay, cool. Oh, uh, I did give you... Um, yeah, I did give you night vision 10 feet. Uh, do, do you have um, vice out? Because I believe vice will glow. Vice will glow in darkness, the brightness of a torch. Okay. So, but if he has his thing out, then that nullifies that. Right. Okay. So it looks like we've got uh, an eight from mm -hmm. Silas. Next, the only one that succeeded. Twenty-four from from Medric, and a four eight. from uh, from Annie. Wow, Medric's the perceptive, like understands all the things. All right. The stone around you is solid. Um, but as you light up the torch and as your eyes all adjust, you start to notice that the, the surface of the floor, which definitely feels like worked stone, um, has symbolism all throughout it. Um, but the symbolism has been worn th as though through a long a period of time, um, almost as though the entire place was at one point enchanted. Um, that's what all of you notice just from the lights going on. Uh, Medric, however... As all of you start to get your bound, your, your, um, I was going to say boundaries. That's not the word. Bearings. Uh, bearings. Thank you. As all of you, all of you start to get your bearings, you hear voices echoing through the stone. Um, you got a 24. So you're able to distinguish, I'll say effectively three different voices. One of them fairly close, the other two much further away. Um, but they're holding a conversation as if they don't care to be overheard because they don't seem to notice anyone else there. First, the voice that's close. The voice that's close is not speaking with words. Or at least the words are mumbled and confused and angry and joyous and twisted and mumbled and grumbled, and it sounds like a combination of um, a dog reading Shakespeare. Take that as you will. <laughs> the other two voices, one is very clear, very commanding, and on the edge of familiarity. The other one is strangely jovial, guttural, and let's say commanding in a different way. Um, the words aren't distinct from this far away. You can tell that they're, they're quite some far distance away. But the tone of the voice and the kinds of voices bring you to mind of two people.
two people you probably didn't expect to see in the same room. Mm -hmm. Who is it? The commanding uh, feminine voice belongs to the Baroness. The growling, joyous, and commanding voice, it takes you a moment. Is that the closer one or... Uh, no, this, these are the two that are farther away. Okay. The two actually distinct voices. Yeah. Um, the second which one... Which one sounded more, more feminine? You didn't say... The Bar- Baroness's sounded feminine. Yeah. Yes, but was that the first one you explained or the second one that you explained that were, was further away? These two voices the are both one. far away. The grumbly yes. dog, dog reading Shakespeare, that's the one that's closest. Yeah. Yes, but there's one that was commanding and one that was commanding in a different way. You didn't indicate which one sounded more feminine. Right, sorry. I'm so assuming the, it's going to be the first one. The, the first one was feminine commanding and yeah. confident and calm. That is the Baroness's voice. The second one is commanding, but mostly getting the sense of it being commanding as in in control of the situation. Confident. A little bit joyous. A little bit playful. And it takes you a while to recognize the voice as coming from an enormous mouth. One lined with a lot of teeth. That belonged to Tauzek Riva. Who you last saw in a pocket dimension. As Catherine was sucked through a hole... And as the rest of you fled, trying to save those who had been brought in to that pocket dimension in the haunted house. And there's a sort of large laugh that comes from Tao Zekriva. And oh, what is that? Was Word. that the beholder? That was the beholder. Okay. With the bow tie. With the bow tie, in fact. Ironic that you mentioned him. Um, and shouting, kind of a confirmation in the midst of, of raucous laughter. It will be done. In Oculon's name, it will be done. Good dealing with you. And I think that's where we're going to pause for tonight. Was that Tao's ex voice or their That was Tao's ex voice. Okay. Do any of us recognize the name Oculon? Um, you can make either a history or religion role if you are trained. All right, I'll make a religion role. I, I will make a history. I am not. That uh, is my least bad role. This is my. <laughs> Other than the one test role. Womp. Okay, so. Okay. The religion role does not prove anything. The uh, the the untrained heathen does not have anything. Um, but for you, uh, Annie, um, Oculon doesn't ring a bell in terms of a historical figure. It rings a bell in terms of one of the fairy tales that you were told as a kid about an enormous one-eyed creature that wanted to devour the world. And Dudek kind of mutters, that does not sound good. And that's where we'll bring it to close, unless there's any last minute questions. No. Writing down notes. No worries. That's why I was asking if there's any questions, right. because I know that there's potentially a whole bunch of questions, but anything about the immediate scene that, that uh, you want clarification? Do we now understand the Baroness is speaking to Tauzek Riva, and there's some other weird creature that's closer to you, which is muttering in an insane dog-like growl, but seeming to say words that don't make sense? I'll immediately turn the light off the hammer. We got company. <laughs> and just like that, the light goes out. Uh, which I think actually now, because you have your goggles, right, Annie? So I, think... I have goggles, I think. Mm-hmm. Didn't you get goggles? Maybe you don't have yeah, goggles. Silas made you goggles that last. Oh, month. yeah. They only uh, last an hour, though. 
Yeah. So, so I basically rely on my blind sense unless I don't need to. Fair enough. Well, uh, and uh, Silas would make sure that Dudek is not in front, so he'd move in front of him. <laughs> I would make sure that he's like in between us. I'll, I'll take the rear. All right. Does Medric want to place himself in this uh, scenario? I will. Just so that we're in the right place. Incidentally, on my layer, I also have uh, Horus and Verendel, depending on who you're going to choose to go with you. <laughs> All right. Oh, I can't choose Horus because he just left. Probably stole stuff that I haven't noticed. I mean, having more magic people with us when we're trying to get back sounds like a better idea. Yeah. Actually, That's the true. portal specialist. <laughs> exactly. It's all who you want to risk. All right. That's it for tonight. I want to thank my players for uh, the patience, <laughs> letting me take a little extra time to get ready for the session. Uh, and uh, we should return in two weeks. We'll make sure to check our schedules and see how we're operating. But I think we'll be able to, to come back, I believe, on the, on the 20th of November. Yeah. I say that. And now I've doomed it to being entirely possibly inaccurate. But I hope you've had fun watching. I think hope oh, you guys have had fun playing. Uh, getting we did. back to this. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, yeah, if you want to see more, you can see the rest of it. This is session 62 of the uh, second campaign. Can you believe it? Uh, it's weird how, how it adds up. What is time? Exactly. You can find it is us a on, great confusion. You can find us on Twitch uh, on those Sundays when we run from three o'clock Atlantic time, which is now Atlantic Sa Atlantic daylight time because time just shifted again. Uh, you can also find it on YouTube. Look for ENCAF one and CAF one, and look for us under the Legend of the Drowned Isles or even the Legends of the Drowned Isles Campaign Two, uh, the Great Confusion playlist. All right. Until next time, have a good one, folks. Bye.